So, so actually, this is the second uh, lecture in our lecture series with Victor on Stark Hagner points, but it's actually my first lecture. So, I want to begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to here. It's really a great pleasure to be participating in this AWS. Uh, so, so uh, I want to begin by summarizing what was done in our first lecture. So, we Victor in this uh, talk described variants of the Hagner point construction, which he uh, started his lecture describing uh, briefly. And those variants were based on higher dimensional algebraic cycles on varieties. And we, gave, we, we coined the word Chow Hagner points to describe these generalizations of Hagner points based on higher dimensional algebraic cycles. And the plan for the re remainder of the lecture series is the following. So in the last two lectures that we're going to be giving, the one this evening and uh, the one this afternoon and, and uh, on Tuesday, we will focus exclusively on the chow hegner points that are attached to a very special kind of cycles, namely diagonal cycles on triple products of modular curves and Kugel-Sato varieties, but in fact really focusing mainly on diagonal cycles on the triple product of modular curves. This will really be the focus of our of our student projects in particular. But what I want to do today in this morning lecture is to step back a little bit and indicate how these very special types of constructions fit into a broader framework related to stark Hegner points. Because of course, one question that might have occurred to some of you is how is this project, this, these particular calculations, how are they related to stark Hegner points? Which are after all the title of our lecture series. So I want to deliver on the implicit promise of that title by connecting this to, to, to this larger framework. So uh, in some sense, uh, I, I, we, we don't want, especially the, the less experienced participants in this lecture series, to feel like the, 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 the blind man in the tale of the, free, of, the, of the six blind men and the elephant. So I don't know if you know the story. It's the story of, of uh, six blind men who are walking in the forest, and they run into an elephant, and they've never encountered an elephant before. So one of them feels the trunk, and they say, oh, it looks like an elephant must be like a snake. The other feels the leg, and, and says, oh, an elephant is like a tree, and so on and so forth. So uh, you're going to be focusing on a very small part of this overall story, namely this theory of child hanger points attached to diagonal cycles. What I want to do today is give you at least an idea of what the entire elephant is, <laughs> not just this small piece. Okay. So what is, let me begin by asking this question, which is maybe overdue by now, what is a stark Hegner point? So uh, the, for the first answer is I don't really know what a stark Hegner point is, but here is Stark and here is Hegner. <laughs> and here's a point there. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> anyway. so, but okay, so uh, we don't really have a precise mathematical definition for what a stark Hegner point is, but I can it kind of gives you a, a, a rough uh, informal idea. So for us, a star Hegner point is any point on an elliptic curve which arises from cycles on some kind of modular variety. And the cycles are not necessarily algebraic. And that's maybe the key feature of the construction, that we don't insist on working with algebraic cycles. So to, uh, I want to begin now by giving a prototypical example of this construction. Uh, which are points arising from ATR cycles. Which um, So I'll begin by giving you a bit of motivation for w working out that example. So uh, thanks to Hegner points, as Victor explained in his lecture uh, yesterday, we know we have this fantastic result, which gives us strong evidence for the Bertrand and Dyer conjecture, namely that if the order of vanishing of the Hasseve L series of elliptic curves at most one, then the rank is exactly as predicted by the Bertrand and Dyer conjecture, we also know Shah is finite in those cases. And that's true for all elliptic curves over Q, and it follows from the work of gross and coley wagen in which the fundamental ingredient is, of course, the Hegner points that an elliptic curve is endowed with. Okay? So thanks to work of Zhang and his school, we also know that similar results hold for many elliptic curves over totally real fields. And these results exploit Hegner points on Shimura curves attached to quaternion algebras of totally real fields. These results are known for many elliptic curves of totally real fields, but not for all of them. And this is also something that was briefly alluded to 
in uh, Victor's lecture of yesterday. So there are these mysterious elliptic curves which fall somehow outside the scope of the powerful techniques that were developed by, by uh, well, I mean, that, that have been developed by Zhang and, and his collaborators. The simplest example of a mysterious elliptic curve is an elliptic curve of conductor 1 over a real quadratic field. So such elliptic curves are actually not so mysterious because, in fact, their L functions do not vanish. The sinus function, I mean, sorry, the sinus functional equation of the L function is 1, so generically we expect that the L function does not vanish at the central point. But you can make the situation a bit more interesting by introducing a quadratic character of the totally real field and asking for the twists of this elliptic curve and asking for, to prove BSD for such quadratic twists. So the basic question is the following. Show that if the order of vanishing of the Hasebe L function twisted by chi is at most 1, then the rank of that quadratic twist over F is as predicted by BSD. Okay, that's, uh, and this question is tantalizingly close to what we know how to do using Hegner points and, and Zhang's methods, but it really lies beyond what we know. There's a, there's, a, there's a key mystery, there's something missing, so that if you could prove this result, I would be really impressed. I mean, there would, you, you would have to have an idea which, as far as I know, is not, not available out there at present. So what, what do we know about these curves? Well, we have the theorem of Matteo Longo, which at least proves the rank zero case of BSD. So it tells us that for these twists, if the L function is non-zero, then at least the model vague group is finite. Uh, the idea here being that even if you don't have Hegner points, because, I mean, the point actually I should have said before, the reason why these curves are mysterious is that they do not arise in the Jacobian of any Shimura curve. Therefore, we can't start off the argument. We don't, we don't know how to produce any nice system of points on that curve. Okay, but uh, so, the, so the mechanism behind Longo's proof is the theory of congruence in modular forms, which shows that even if E does not appear in the Jacobian of a modular curve, its P to the n torsion does arise as a constituent of the Galois representation arising in the Jacobian of many Shimura curves, and we can use that to push the argument through in the case of non vanishing. You, you know the uh, uh, yes, I mean, so, uh, let's see. Yeah, I think that it's known for all elliptic curves of conductor 1 over real quadratic fields, modularity. I believe. So maybe, I'm, maybe I'm wrong about it. Let's just, uh, maybe I should, okay, I'll, I'll assume modularity, to be safe. I mean, yeah. There have been many results, of course, on modularity for totally real fields. And, and, oh, I'll say that short. It means that the L function uh, is attached to an automorphic form. And the automorphic form in question will be something, arise, uh, will be a Hilbert modular form. The kind of things that we saw in Kartex, actually. Okay. So we have this result, and then there's a, the PhD thesis of Yu Zhao, which was defended actually just two days before coming to the Arizona Winter School. And uh, contain, one of the results it contains is this theorem that if E is a Q curve, namely it's isogenous to its Galois conjugate, then we can show that when the order of vanishing is 1, so in the analytic rank 1 case of BSD, there is actually a point. And here the point is that even though the curve has, has uh, conductor 1, the fact that it's a Q curve allows us to realize it as a, a, Jaco as a quotient of the Jacobian of a, of a classical modular curve. So there. But uh, in spite of these two results, we really have no idea how to produce a point on the quadratic twist over F in a general situation. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about now is a construction, a conjectural one, that allows us to compute a point on this twist in practice via what are called ATR cycles. And these are going to be non-algebraic cycles on a modular variety attached to the elliptic curve, and this modular variety is going to be a Hilbert modular surface. So let me set it up. I'm going to let Y be the open Hilbert modular surface attached to this elliptic curve. So the modularity tells us, so this is just a very simple object. I take two uh, a product of two copies of the Poincaré upper half plane. So I've indexed them by calling them h1 and h2, but they're just two copies of h. And the Hilbert modular group, SL2 of the ring of integers of f, acts on these two copies via the two real embeddings of f into, into r. And so it acts in, in this discrete way. Uh, the, the orbits are discrete, and the quotient is a nice open uh, two-dimensional complex variety, which I call y of c. And I'm going to now give myself a matrix in SL2OF, in the Hilbert modular group, having a unique fixed point under, for, relative to its action on the first upper half plane. I'm going to call that fixed point tau1. 
And so then the first thing we can say is that the field K, which is generated by the eigenvalues of this matrix, is an example of an ATR extension. We saw this terminology already yesterday. In this context, an ATR extension of F is a quadratic extension for which the first real embedding, tau1, extends to a complex embedding, and the other extends to a real, lifts to a real embedding. And the idea now is that to each such matrix, we will attach a cycle, which I'll call delta gamma in Y of C. This cycle is going to be of real dimension one. So it's not going to be algebraic. It won't be the complex points of any algebraic subvariety of Y of C. And the point is that it's going to be that this real dimension one cycle behaves very much like a Hegner points. So here's the definition. I take my, so I remind you that tau 1 is this fixed point of gamma acting on the first upper half plane. If I look at the action of this matrix gamma on the second upper half plane, one can show uh, that it actually, these two fixed points are going to lie on the boundary of the upper half plane. Unless the matrix is of finite order, but I want to exclude that case. Okay, so if the matrix is of infinite order, the fixed points necessarily have to lie on the boundary. So the picture is something like this. On the H1, I have a fixed point tau 1, and H2 I have these two fixed points lying on the boundary, and I can let this gamma sub gamma be the product of this fixed point times the geodesic joining tau 2 to tau 2 prime on the upper half plane. So this is like isomorphic to R, and the, the matrix gamma preserves this geodesic thing, and so if I take the quotient of that geodesic by the action of gamma, I get a region which is topologically a circle, which is R mod Z, and I view that as embedded in Y of C. So that's a physical one-dimensional cycle on the Hilbert modular surface. And the key fact is that these cycles are null homologous. They are actually the boundaries of two-dimensional regions. This is actually not quite correct. Uh, I mean, the, the, the reason for this is that essentially the Hilbert modular surface has no interesting H1. So it's not quite true. I mean, there could be some torsion in the cohomology, and that, that, that would mean maybe not the cycle itself, but some multiple of it is no homologous. But I'll ignore that issue. So we just, you know, otherwise you would multiply this by some integer and then write it as the boundary of something. So I'll assume that it's not, it's not homologous after, after tensing with Q, in other words. Okay. So now we have this, this uh, conject we're, we're going to use in the construction. This conjecture of Oda on periods, which is very much the theme of the lectures of Kartik Prasanna in, uh, in this AWS, which tells us something about the periods attached to two forms uh, related to the elliptic curve. So the Oda's conjecture is that for any closed two form, oh, I, I didn't tell you what this omega g is, but the modularity of the elliptic curve tells us that the h1 of E tensor H1 of E relative to the two embeddings, this kind of tensor induction that arose in the Kartik Prasanna's lectures, arises in the H2 of the Hilbert modular surface. So I can look at this, this isotopic part of the H2 corresponding to the elliptic curve. It's a rank four or four dimensional complex vector space. Um, and I can take any closed two form in there and consider the set of periods attached to this two form which I call lambda g. And Oda's conjecture, which is, a, I guess, a, in some way a special case of these uh, results of Shimura and, uh, and Harris, which, uh, which um, Kartik uh, mentioned in his talk, is that we can say something about the period lattice. And the way I like to state it is that for a suitable choice of differential form in this uh, space omega g, the corresponding lattice of periods of omega g is isomorphic to the, or at least commensurable with, the Weierstrass lattice of the elliptic curve. So the quotient C mod lambda g is at least isogenous to E of C. Okay, now we can use this period conjecture to define invariance, very much in the spirit of the Abel Jacobi uh, uh, definition which we saw in Victor's lecture yesterday. We can consider, so we define the Abel Jacobi of that ATR cycle delta gamma evaluated on the, the differential omega g to be simply the integral of omega g along any two dimensional region 
whose boundary is delta gamma. So that's this delta inverse of delta gamma there. And so that's a complex number, that integral, but it depends on the choice of a region. Any two regions differ by something closed, with so a closed two-dimensional region in the Hilbert modular surface. In other words, by a period. So this complex number is well-defined mod lambda g. So it's an element of this complex torus, which is identified with E of C. Okay, so that means that we have a recipe for making a point on the elliptic curve given any kind of matrix which is elliptic in one embedding and hyperbolic in the second embedding. Now we can consider the set of all, I consider uh, the set of matrices in gamma of a fixed trace T, and I write this as a union, a disjoint union of conjugacy classes of matrices gamma 1 up to gamma H. And the conjecture that I made with Logan, I think in, in 2003, is that these complex points belong to E of H, at least after tensoring with Q, where H is a specific ring class field of the ATR extension K of the real quadratic field F. Uh, so that's the sort of an algebraicity conjecture concerning these points. Moreover, we conjecture that these points are all conjugate to each other under the Galois action, and therefore, if we take this sum here, we should get a point in E of K, in the E of this quadratic extension, and that point is of infinite order precisely when the derivative of the L-series is non-zero. In other words, this L-series has a simple zero at S equals 1. So that's the conjecture. So that really tells us that these ATR points behave exactly like, um, like Hegner points. It's the same kind of phenomenon. So um, these ATR points, which I just described, are defined, therefore, over abelian extensions of a quadratic ATR extension, K, of the real quadratic field F. So I want to now mention a second setting for the stark hegner construction, which is equally mysterious in some, in maybe even more in some sense, I don't know. But it is a little bit more concrete and uh, of immediate interest, maybe, because it concerns elliptic curves over defi defined over the rationals. So here, in the previous example, we had to take an elliptic curve over a base, which was a real quadratic field. Here, we're going to consider elliptic curves over Q. But we're going to try to construct points over class fields of real quadratic fields. Okay, So the simplest case where the construction applies is one where E is a elliptic curve of prime conductor P, and K is a real quadratic field in which this prime P is inert. Now, in, the, in this construction, before we had, of course, the prime pair per half plane was playing a, a crucial role in the construction. Here we're going to have a, to, you, to invoke this prime P is going to play the role of the first infinite place before. And so we're going to need to uh, use a symmetric space, which is a piadic analog of the upper half plane, which is simply the complement of P1QP in P1 of CP. So that's what I call HP. It's the Grinfeld piadic upper half plane. So one can make a kind of formal dictionary between these two settings. The setting of ATR cycles, which I just described before, and the setting of real quadratic points where the analog is to produce where, where the goal is to produce analogs of Hegner points for real quadratic fields. So here we started with an elliptic curve with a base field which is real quadratic. In this new setting, our base field is going to be the field of rational numbers. In the ATR cycle situation, the two real places of F played a crucial role, and we labeled them infinity zero and infinity one, and they played asymmetrical roles in the construction. Here, of course, you don't have enough infinite places, so the prime p, this Archimedean, non-Archimedean prime, is going to stand in for the place infinity zero. It's going to play the, the role of infinity zero. Now, our elliptic curve E over F of conductor 1 is now going to be replaced by the elliptic curve E over Q of conductor P. The point being that somehow this E over F admits a kind of analytic description as C modulo a lattice at the two infinite places. Here, the elliptic curve over Q, because its conductor is divisible by P, it has a kind of what's called an, uh, multiplicative reduction at P. So there's a Tate uniformization, which is very similar to the description of via the Weierstrass equation, I mean, uh, C mod lambda. And so that's the... And then, of course, the ATR cycles were living in the symmetric space, H cross H mod SL2OF, which is the, the complex points of the open Hilbert modular surface. So the analogous symmetric space for this construction of real quadratic points is simply the product of a piadic upper half plane 
and a classical upper half plane, modulo the action of the group SL2 of Z of 1 over P, which acts diagonally by Mobius transformations. So this group acts with dense orbits on each factor, but has discrete orbits on the product. So it's a nice discrete action on the product. And now uh, an extension of F quadratic, which is ATR. The analogous condition here is that the first place, namely P, should be inert, should not be split. And the second, the, the, the infinity, should be split, namely the, uh, the K over Q should be actually a real quadratic field. So K is now going to be our, our uh, real quadratic field. And then these ATR cycles, you can mimic the construction. I leave this as an exercise. If you think about how you would write down a cycle of this product of HP cross H, you do it exactly the same way. You get a one-dimensional cycle, which is topologically a circle in HP cross H mod SL2 Z1 over P. And those are these kind of real quadratic cycles. They're indexed naturally by, by matrices in SL2Z, which are hyperbolic, and they correspond, therefore, to real quadratic fields. Their eigenvalues generate real quadratic extensions of Q. So we can develop all these notions with sufficient precision. I'm not going to do this in this lecture. This is just to give you an idea of the scope of the theory. But we can develop these notions to the extent of being able to attach to the modular form F of weight 2 and level P, a kind of object which plays the role of a Hilbert modular form on this quotient. And one can then make sense, in some sense, of this expression, the, in, the, uh, so the Abel Jacobi of that uh, real quadratic cycle evaluated on omega g. So this is, a, when you formalize the definition, write it down, you find that it's canonically an element in kp star mod q to the z, where kp is the piatic completion of the real quadratic field k, and therefore can be viewed as a local point, a piatic point on E. Now this works for any piatic ATR cycle in delta gamma. And then we get this uh, collection of local points, and we conjecture, like in the conjecture with Logan, that these points are defined conjecturally over ring class fields of this real quadratic field k. And these are prototypical examples, again, of star k points. So uh, we can actually compute these uh, star k points. Uh, there, there are fantastic algorithms that compute them with very high accuracy due to, uh, based on ideas of Glenn Stevens and Rob Polak. Uh, I guess the baby doesn't deserve any credit for the overconvergent modular symbols. <laughs> But that was the best picture of Rob that I could get on the internet. So, um, so, 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 yeah. So, yeah, yeah and, and so, the, the, that's one of the the connections between uh, overconvergent modular symbols, which Rob is describing in his lecture series, and this uh, theory of star Kagner points. So, what's the drawback of star Kagner points versus the Chow Hagner points, which Victor described in his lecture? In Victor's lecture the points that were being constructed via algebraic cycles. And then we saw that there was this nice theoretical mechanism based on the Hodge conjectures and the Tate conjectures, which predicted the existence of algebraic correspondences. And these correspondences were being used to transfer points uh, on, or, or cycles on a variety V to points on an elliptic curve. Okay? Here, for the star kagner situation, where we deal with non-algebraic cycles, we have, to, to the best of our knowledge, none of these theoretical explanations, and we really don't understand at all the mechanisms which would account for the algebraicity of the star kagner points. So what's the advantage of star kagner points relative to chow kagner points? Well, it's exactly the same thing. Namely, they're very mysterious. We don't understand them at all. And of course, in mathematics, we naturally gravitate towards situations where we're, 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 which are really mysterious and we don't understand, because by delving into those, we hope to gain a really new insights. Okay, so that's the summary of how I feel about these, these constructions. So what we would like to know is whether it's possible to use this theory to first not just prove conjectures, but get actually unconditional results. And in some sense, the gold standard for this kind of construction is whether we can get new cases of the Bertrand and Dyer conjecture, get constructions of points which we could not produced before and use those as in the, the proofs of Coley Wagen and Gossagier to get really fundamentally new cases of BSD. So there's a theorem which falls far short of that and by, by many people. I mean, so there was a paper of Bertolini, Bescupta, and myself that did it for modular curves and it was later extended by Longo, Roger, and Vigny to cover the setting of Shimura curves, where we assume the conjectures on Stark Hegner points attached 
to real quadratic fields. In a somewhat stronger uh, setup than what I uh, alluded to here, there's a more precise form of the conjecture that was formulated by Samit Dasgupta in his PhD thesis. And relying on that stronger version, we can conclude very much uh, uh, the kind of statement that you would get out of applying Coley Wagen's Euler system of Hegner points, with Stark Hegner points re re replacing Hegner points, namely that if the L function of E over this real quadratic field, twisted by a ring class character of K, does not vanish at S equals 1, then the chi components of the model Vey group of E over the ring class field, which is cut out by chi, is trivial for all chi ring class characters. And this result is something that we do not know how to prove unconditionally uh, as soon as chi is not quadratic. When chi is not quadratic, these fields, we don't have any method for producing points that would allow us to, or cohomology classes that would allow us to bound the sum of group in terms of L values. Okay. So, of course, it's obvious, I guess, that star Kegner points, if we could establish their basic properties, most importantly, their algebraicity, would yield information about the arithmetic of E over a building such as the real quadratic fields, much as Hegner points do for the case of imaginary quadratic fields, right? So the question which maybe one would like to ask is whether it's possible to control the arithmetic of this elliptic curve over ring class fields, or real quadratic fields, without invoking star Kegner points. And then the, the, maybe the strategy would be to, to reverse the process, gain, look at some unconditional structure, which accounts for the, um, for the arithmetic of E over these mysterious class fields, and then use those to gain some insight into star Kegner points. So I want to now uh, outline a, a one possible direction which might lead to, to progress of that sort. So uh, now I get back to the, to the diagonal cycles, which Victor kind of promised in his first lecture, and which will be the main sole focus of the last two lectures that we're going to give in the AWS. So these, uh, the, these so-called diagonal cycles are going to live on a variety which is a product of three Kugasato varieties. So I give myself three integers. So Kugasato variety we saw also in Victor's lecture. It's just that you take the universal elliptic curve over a modular curve and you look at, it, look at its R-fold fiber product for a suitable integer R. Okay? So I'm going to give myself these three integers, which I call R1, R2, R3. And uh, I arrange them in decreasing order. And I assume, crucially, that the largest one, namely R1, is still smaller than the sum of the other two, less than or equal. And then I let R be the average of those three integers. And then, so the general setup here, we have a variety V, which is going to... What? Oh, I'm sorry, yes, not, not the I, okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's what's there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, so then I have this V, which is this product of the three uh, Kugelsato varieties of dimension R1 plus 1, R2 plus 1 and R3 plus 1. So it's an R, R full fiber product, but, but it's over a base, so the dimension goes up by 1. So the total dimension of V is 2R plus 3. And it turns out, when you make the analysis, and this is actually, I'm not going to go into this, but it's written down precisely in the notes that we uh, produced for the AWS, that there's, in some sense, only one interesting way to embed the R-fold Kugasato variety in this product of three Kugasato varieties. So uh, this is what I call delta, this cycle. It's a sort of a, a diagonal type embedding. On the base, it corresponds to more or less embedding the modular curve diagonally, the triple product. And you can extend that to uh, an embedding of the Kugasato variety. So we have this nice cycle on V. It's of dimension R plus 1, therefore of co-dimension R plus 2 in V. And so it lives in the Chow group of co-dimension R plus 2 cycles on V. One can show that this cycle is... So, for example, if R1, R2, and R3 were all equal, then uh, well, that, wouldn't ha that couldn't happen. Yeah, so it's kind of, it's a little bit more complicated than the web, essentially. It's a, so morally, you should think of it as a diagonal, okay? But there's a little bit of annoying combinatorics, which I would be hard-pressed to do on the board. But it's sort of like, uh, the point is that, I mean, I, I've pushed some things under the rug. One thing is that we apply 
certain projectors to these child groups to get rid of some kind of uninteresting pieces in the cohomology. And then we're interested in what we can make that's kind of new and that, that we didn't encounter before. And when, when you make this analysis, you find that up to obvious things like permuting the fibers, uh, that there's really only one interesting embedding of this Kubasato. But okay, I mean, so if, if all the R's are zero, and maybe this is the only thing you should, you should think of, of, in fact, in our AWS project, we will only consider the case where all of the R's are one or two or three R zero, which is already complicated enough from a computational point of view. Um, so there it's just a diagonal. This delta is just the, the, the principal diagonal and the product of the three modular curves. And uh, modified a little bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but morally it's that. Okay. So, um, so, so the first thing about this cycle, which is important, is that it's, uh, it's actually homologically trivial. If you look at its class in the, hom in the homology or cohomology of the variety, that class is zero. You cannot, you, I mean, uh, Victor mentioned briefly in his lecture, the cycle class, the, the most natural way to think about it as a, as a, in a topological sense, I mean, as an element of the dual of the space of, of differential forms, and the dual of the Durand cohomology. But you, there's also an etal analog, which is going to be useful very shortly, which is going to be actually important for what I say later. So you can consider the cycle class as living in an etal cohomology group rather than in a Betty cohomology. It's in the 2R plus 4th etal cohomology of the variety with a tail twist of R plus 2, and it's an invariant of the Galois. This is actually, this target space is an example, I mean, it is the space of tail cycles attached to this variety. But the class of delta is zero in any case here. But whenever you have a null homologous cycle, you can consider its Abel Jacobi image, as Victor described in his lecture. Uh, this Abel Jacobi image has an etal avatar, which lands in the H1 of the cohomology of one lower index with the same tail twist. So there's this kind of general uh, mechanism that, which is part of the, of the formalism of etal cohomology, which allows you to produce these extension classes in the category of Galois, of, a, of elatic Galois representations by taking etal cohomology essentially of the open varieties, which you get by taking V and removing the cycle, that you, that you, this the cycle delta. So we get these interesting cohomology classes. And anyone who is familiar with the methods of Kolivagin knows that when we can make cohomology classes in a systematic way attached to Galois representations, then we have a hope of using these classes to bound the associated Selma group of the Galois representation. So we, here we can now let, consider three modular forms, which I'll call F, G, and H, of the weights that are relevant for these forms to appear in the cohomology of the relevant Kugasato varieties. So if we, can take, if we take now the isotypic component of this cohomology class, Abel, of the image of delta and Abel Jacobi et al., we obtain a cohomology class which lives in the H1 of Q with values in the tensor product of the three serre de Ligne Galois representations attached to the modular forms F, G, and H, with some tail twist, which you should ignore anyway in this presentation. So, so here, my, my HA et al. takes values in this Galois representation, this H2R plus 3 et al. Of, uh, now, you can apply the Kunath theorem to, I mean, so you can study this Galois cohomology, this, this Galois representation. Kunath gives you, I mean, so there are many pieces that are not interesting, but the main piece of interest is the tensor product of the middle cohomologies of the three Kuga, Kuga Sato varieties. Because remember that V is a product of three Kuga Satos. So this cohomology, which is the middle cohomology, I should have said, of V, has a piece which is the middle cohomology, the tensor product of the three middle cohomologies. On the three middle cohomologies, you have action of Heck operators. And the Heck operators act via their action on modular forms of weight R1 plus 2, R2 plus 2, and R3 plus 2. Okay? My R's here are playing the role of the, of the K in Rob's lecture. So it's the weight minus two. And so you can then cut out from this kind of big uh, Galois representation one piece that you're interested in focusing on which corresponds to this triple of modular forms. So that's the, the this, this setup. So we take this relevant isotopic component and we get a cohomology class in this Galois representation. 
And we know, and we'll be seeing very special cases of this kind of relationship in the student projects in the, in the uh, evenings, that the behaviors of these objects, of these cycles and their images under Abel Jacobi, are intimately connected with certain central critical values of L functions. In this case, we expect that the cycles, for example, should be non-trivial precisely when the L series of this triple product of three modular forms has a simple zero at the, the central critical point, which is R plus 2. So here I'm not going to say very much about these, these L functions. Uh, we'll talk about them more, I guess, in the afternoon lecture by Victor. He's going to give a more systematic introduction. But for now, let me just say that these L functions are defined by order factors of degree 8. So if you're familiar with the general mechanism for defining an L function and attaching to a Galois representation an L function, here you just take the tensor product of these three two-dimensional L-adic representations, you get an eight-dimensional representation, and you, the order series is this, this rank in L function of degree eight. Okay, so I'm... But in some, in some sense, you might say, well, we don't really want to, um, to focus so much on these kind of L-series. They're a little bit complicated, and defined by these high-degree order factors. We really want to say something about the BSD conjecture, in particular for real quadratic fields, so you want to relate these complicated L functions, but which have some kind of geometric uh, avatars, be it these cohomology classes, to L functions of elliptic curves over real quadratic fields. So how do you do that? So I'm now going to explain how you could hope to go from ranking triple product L functions to star Hegner points over real quadratic fields. So the position of these star Hegner points, that's part of the conjecture that we, that we made uh, concerning them, is that they should be controlled exactly like classical Hegner points, by the central critical values of the L function of E over the real quadratic field, twisted by chi, as chi ranges over all the ring class characters of the real quadratic field S. Okay, those, those, those are the, the L series which control the star Hagner points. Now, we can do the following trick. We can take this chi, and we can write it as a product of two characters, chi1, chi2, where these characters can be pretty much anything for the, the level of precision I'm, I'm I'm uh, using now, but the key condition is that they should be of signature 1 minus 1. So at one of the infinite places they should be real, and at the other infinite place they should be uh, odd. They should cut out a, a uh, so they cut out a kind of ATR extension, I suppose. Um, and the reason why I want that is that then, the, if I look at the induced representation from F to Q of these two characters, I get two-dimensional representations of the Galois group of Q, and these representations are odd. Okay. The reason why that's useful is that it allows us to relate these two-dimensional representations to holomorphic modular forms. There's a classical result of Hecke, which asserts that there are modular forms, G and H, of weight 1, whose L functions agree with the R and L series of these two representations, V1 and V2. So we have this, these identities of L series. And those translate into L identity for the L series of the triple product. So if I now consider the triple product F tensor G tensor H, this F is of weight 2, and these G and H are of weight 1, this is just, it's the L, L function of F tensor V1 tensor V2, but V1 tensor V2 decomposes as a sum of two irreducible representations attached to chi and, and, and another character. This chi 2 rho means composition of chi with the involution in Galef over Q. So this identity is important because it relates the L series that we're interested in for understanding BSD for real quadratic fields with an L function, which is this triple product L function, which we can hope to relate to geometry via the constructions of diagonal cycles, which I described in the previous slides. Okay. Um, but, okay, but, but there's a crucial difficulty which is that here, we're outside the range where the construction that I described earlier applies. Remember that we started with these integers r1, r2, r3, and the modular forms were of weight rj plus 2. So the modular forms, in order to have a geometric interpretation as arising in the cohomology of some kind of Kugasato variety, had to be of weight at least 2. And these modular forms g and h, which I pulled out of the theorem of Hecke, are of weight 1. So, I think it's always been our feeling, although we're not completely convinced of this, uh, Victor and me, that 
to really gain more insights into, um, I mean, into BSD using constructions of points based on algebraic cycles, it's very important to combine these purely geometric techniques with ideas arising from the theme of piadic variation of modular forms, which we also saw yesterday in uh, Rob Polak's lecture. Okay, so a slight extension of what we learned in the lecture of Rob, and I just mentioned the theorem of Hida, which is going to be crucial for the construction, that says that given these two modular forms, G and H, of weight 1, we can fit these two modular forms in a piadic family of modular forms, exactly in the sense of Rob's lecture. So there exists sort of formal Q-series with coefficients in some ring of analytic functions in a piadic neighborhood of 1, in my case. I write them like this such that the values of these formal series evaluated at 1, in other words, the weight 1 specializations, agree with the formula G and H that I started with, and moreover that these are genuine piadic families, so when I look at the higher weight specializations, I get some normalized eigenforms of these weights, of higher weights. Okay, so with that, we could try to take these cohomology classes that we associate to forms of higher weight and allow them to or hope that they will vary piadically along with the Hida families of modular forms. So the general, there's a general philosophy, which I, I think was also alluded to in, in Rob's lecture, that whenever you can associate natural piadic invariance to a classical modular form, and then you have a piadic family of modular forms, well, these piadic invariants should also vary in piadic families. So we saw that in Rob's lecture because we considered modular symbols attached to classical modular forms, and we saw that then, if we have piadic families of modular forms, there should be piadic families of modular symbols, those are the overconvergent modular symbols. And maybe an even more basic example is the serre de Lee piadic representation attached to a classical eigenform. Okay, so uh, here there's a classical important theorem of Hida that tells us that uh, given such this piadic family G of modular forms, we can attach to it a lambda-adic representation, um, a, a rank 2 lambda module equipped with an action of the Galois group of Q, which satisfies this, that when you tensor with QP via the evaluation homomorphism at K, the sort of weight K specialization essentially that we saw in, also in Rob's lecture, you recover the serre de representation attached to the weight K specialization of, of G, of the, of the family. And this for almost all k bigger than 2. So now, we can also consider the cohomology... So for every k strictly bigger than 1, integer, we can consider the cohomology class attached to f, g, k, h, k. So these are elements of h1 of this 8-dimensional Galois representation, the tensor product of these three 2-dimensional representations. And we would likewise hope that this family of cohomology classes, indexed by varying weights, should, in some sense, move piadically. So there should be some big cohomology class. In the H1 of taking values of the Galois module VF, tensor these uh, Hida lambdaic representations attached to G and H. And the, the condition is that the specialization in weight K of this big cohomology class, we should recover this geometric class that we constructed using diagonal cycles under Kukasato for almost all K. And the way I want to remark that, I mean, this conjecture is very much in the air. We haven't, we haven't, we haven't worked out the details, but there are many analogous constructions already in the literature. For example, there's some very nice work of Ben Howard concerning big cohomology classes attached to Hegner points and chaotic families of modular forms. So this is kind of within that, that framework. And then we can ask a question, which is whether it is possible. Now, if we look at the weight one specialization of this big cohomology class, we would obtain an element of H1 of K with values in the two-dimensional Galois representation attached to E, the take module of E, twisted by this uh, ring class character of the real periodic field. And you can ask if the weight one specialization of this class, this element, is related in any way to stark Hegner points attached to the same data, E over K, together with the character chi. So, now let me sort of get down to, get back down to, uh, 
to Earth. I mean, before seriously attacking these constructions and studying uh, cohomology classes attached to, um, uh, I mean, families of these cohomology classes and so on, it's very natural to focus exclusively on the cycles themselves attached to these uh, diagonal cycles and try to understand their behavior, how they're connected to L functions, maybe see experimentally how those cycles are also connected to congruence and modular forms, L functions, and so on. So we would like to make a careful study of the diagonal cycles and their arithmetic properties that come up in this, uh, in this study. So that's the goal for the winter school. So in the winter school project, there will be nothing piatic. So I mean, maybe I should have said this at the beginning of my talk. Before, if, you, if some of this was a bit uh, advanced, right now, uh, for the next two lectures, we're going to be much more focused and much more basic. We will not invoke any piatic ideas. We will only work with the geometric side of the picture and only study the Abel Jacobi images of the diagonal cycles themselves. What's more, because we're really, we really care a lot about the BSD conjecture and about the, this philosophy of Chow Hagner points, which uh, Victor explained in his lecture, we will really only be interested in the settings where the diagonal cycles which we produce give rise to points on elliptic curves. Also because those are the settings where you can do nice calculations. Okay, so you can do nice numerical calculations and get concrete points on elliptic curves by calculating the Abel Jacobi. So we're going to be largely concerned in the next two lectures with developing concrete strategies for computing the complex Abel Jacobi images of diagonal cycles in situations where those images can be interpreted as points on elliptic curves. And uh, that's really so the, so in other words, the calculation of these child Hagner points will really be our sole focus from now on. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop now. Thank you for your attention.